Well, church, this morning as we celebrate Jesus, the light of the world, I'm going to invite uh, Charles and Judy Mason to come forward, and they're going to share with us the lighting of our Advent candles here this morning. Thank you, Charles and Judy. Well, church, I am old enough to remember that when I was growing up, not every kid got a car when they turned 16. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? And it certainly wasn't new cars if they did happen to get one. It was a, I know it's a different day and age. It's totally foreign to a lot of the people growing up now. Um, but I did not get a car when I turned 16. In fact, I didn't get a car until Melissa and I got married after I was in college. And then the only reason I got a car is because she had one and I married into it. So I remember when I was uh, in, in growing up, not only did I have a car, that meant I had to walk to school every single day. And it was a distance of about a couple miles from my house, even, uh, even as a high schooler I'd have to walk, a couple miles from my house to where the high school was located in my hometown. Now I'm not going to go so far as to say I had to walk uphill both ways, but this time of year I did have to go th- walk through the snow, uh, quite a bit of snow sometimes to get to school. And uh, this time of year, this you know, early December, mid-December, I remember walking to school, and if I had to go to school early, I usually had to be there at like 7 o'clock because we had show choir before school, and I was a part of that. So I would walk to school to get there by 7 o'clock, meant that I would leave before the sun came up. And so I would walk to school in the darkness. And if I ever had to stay after school for any reason, and we're not going to get into what those reasons would be, but if I ever had to stay after school for any reason, it often meant that I would walk home after the sun had gone down. So I would go to school walking in the darkness and come home walking in the darkness. It was always strange this time of year. I was glad that most of my classrooms had windows because at least I knew the sun came up at some point during the day, you know, even if I wasn't outside to see it. Uh, But it was always a strange feeling. I've never really been afraid of the dark, but it, it felt kind of depressing and a little creepy sometimes to be walking home from school in the darkness. The one thing that always kind of lifted my spirits, though, is I remember as I would walk home, passing by all the houses that had their Christmas lights up. And when you're walking in the darkness and the cold, because it was, you know, central Wisconsin, uh, when you're walking in the darkness and the cold, trudging through the snow, trying to get home, seeing the Christmas lights of a house in the distance is, is so appealing. It is so enticing. It just looks so open and warm and friendly. And I, I have no idea what was going on in those houses. It could have been anything but warm and friendly. But it looked so warm and friendly. There was something so appealing about Christmas lights. Am I alone in that or do you all agree with me? Isn't there something just appealing and beautiful about Christmas lights? Well, you know, all throughout this month, we're talking about some of the the decorations and traditions of the Christmas season and 
what the meaning is behind all of them. Why do we have all these things associated with Christmas? Because all the things that we have are, are symbols that remind us, that tell us something about Jesus and about the first Christmas. And so I shared with you last week that we have Christmas trees in our homes. Why do we have Christmas trees? Why do we bring pine trees inside our house, risking the fire danger, you know, of having a, a, a tree inside our house like that? Well, it's because it's a symbol of Jesus. Especially in Western Europe in the Middle Ages when everything was cold and icy and desolate and wintry, the one thing that did not look dead in the wintertime were the evergreen trees. And so they were a symbol of life, even in the midst of death. Life that is enduring, life that is lasting, life that is everlasting. And that is exactly what Christ came into this world to bring us. That he came to bring us everlasting life. He came to bring us a life here in this world that is full, that is uh, filled with his hope and his assurance and blessing and goodness, and a life that will stretch for all of eternity, even in the desolation of winter, in the darkness and winter of this world. Christ offers us life. So we remember that with greenery. We remember that with Christmas trees. Now, I'm willing to bet that most of you have a tree in your house, right? And for almost all of you, there's decorations on the tree, right? Anyone here have a blank tree in your house, just empty tree? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think so. Uh, most of us put decorations on it, right? We put decorations on it. We put lights on it. Sometimes it's hard to tell there's a tree underneath all of it, right? But those decorations, those lights, have a meaning as well, as does the tree itself. So what I want to do this week is I want to look, at you, look with you at this idea of, of what the Christmas lights mean. What do they tell us about Jesus? What do they tell us about the, what we're celebrating here during the season? Why is it that we put up lights? And, and you have to know, it's not just because we remember that there was the star shining in Bethlehem. That's a great thing to remember. But there's a deeper significance to, to light at Christmas time and having the light in the darkness. And it's also not just because it's appealing to people in the darkness of winter to have extra lights. There's a reason behind it. So what I want to do is I want to look at a scripture passage with you here this morning. And the scripture passage comes from the book of 1 John. There's a, there's a lot of different passages that I could have chosen to share with you here this morning that speak about light and what light symbolizes. But I want to share with you 1 John chapter 1, and it's verses 5 through 10. So if you got your Bibles out, follow along, or pull up your Bible app on your phone, and you can follow along. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Not the Gospel of John, the letter of 1 John at the end of the New Testament. So this is what he writes. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Well, like I said, there are a lot of different places, a lot of different passages that I could have chosen this morning to talk about light from the scripture because light and darkness are huge symbols in the Bible, especially in the writings of John. So if you're reading the Gospel of John, if you're reading 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, even when you're reading the book of Revelation, light is a hugely important symbol as is darkness. So light represents goodness. Light represents truth. Even here in this passage, notice how he talked about if we're not living in the light, we're not living in what? In the truth. Light represents truth. It is God's revelation to us. It is his, his guidance, his, his spirit guiding us and leading us and leading us into the truth. Light has this appealing goodness to it in John's writings. The good things that happen happen during the daytime, during the light. And bad things tend to happen in the dark. 
or at least deceptive, uh, betrayal kind of events happen in the darkness. So you go through the Gospel of John, then you have Jesus declaring, I am the light of the world. And then you see things in John's Gospel like Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the nighttime. Why is that? Because darkness represents secrecy. Darkness represents the fact that Nicodemus is betraying his own order, the Pharisees, by coming to Jesus. You have other events that happen in the darkness. The Last Supper, when Jesus is eating with his disciples, and Judas gets up to go and betray Jesus, John says he goes out into the darkness because he's betraying Jesus. When Jesus is crucified on the cross, when he's hanging there and he gives up his spirit, John tells us darkness covered the face of the earth for the time that Jesus was on the cross because God incarnate was dying on that cross on our behalf. But then also you see in John's gospel that when Jesus is raised from the dead, when he comes back to life, you see that it happens on Easter morning at a very particular time. It says, as the sun is rising, as goodness, as life is coming back into the world, the Son of God is raised from the dead. So hugely important symbols. And, and it gets carried on throughout all of his writings, even into the book of Revelation. You can see that there's darkness and there's light. And, and when we get to celebrate in eternity with, with the Lord for, you know, in, in, in heaven for all of eternity, we're told that it is a kingdom of light, that God's presence is light. Over and over again, you see these symbols in, in John's writing. So, so light is the appealing goodness of God. Light is the, the presence of God here in this world, as opposed to the darkness of this world. Light represents purity. Light represents holiness. Light represents goodness. It represents God's grace and his mercy and forgiveness. Over and over again, you see that this is so appealing that, that we should be in the light because God is, here in this passage, God is light, right? He is goodness, he is holiness, he is purity, all of those things. But John's gospels, or John's writings, actually take it one step further. Not only is the presence of God represented as light, not only is Jesus coming into the world talked about as the light of the world coming, but then there is also the appeal that is made through those who believe in him, who follow him. Because once we follow Jesus, once we accept that he is the light of the world, then we receive that light within us. He brings the darkness to light within us. And once we receive that light within us, that presence of God living within us, then we also are called to shine his light out into this world so that other people can come to him so that other people can find his goodness, so that other people can find his forgiveness and his mercy. We are called to shine the light of Jesus. We are the city on the hill. We are the light that cannot be hidden in the darkness, shining out, drawing more and more people, just as those Christmas lights were so appealing to me as I would walk home and would seem to draw me on sometimes. We are to shine the light of Christ in the darkness to draw other people out of the darkness and into his presence. Because, friends, we live in a very, very dark world. We live in a world where it seems like it gets worse day after day, that every day we sink to a new low, and more and more darkness comes in. I don't know if any of you saw this. I came across this on my phone yesterday on the news as I was... Uh, just scrolling and looking at news stories. And I came across a story that apparently in the state capitol building in Iowa right now, for the next two weeks they have a temporary display that a group has put inside the capitol building, and it was the Satanic temp Temple of Iowa. They put a goat-headed statue of Satan in the state capitol building in the state of Iowa. And the article had a statement that was made by a Republican representative in Iowa who happens to also be supposedly a pastor. And the statement was that while the statue is personally repugnant to him, the Satanic Temple followed all of the steps and procedures necessary to 
to have this display put in place. And as much as he didn't like it, we need to support their right to do it, otherwise we won't have the right to display our Christian symbols. At which point I had to resist the strong urge to throw my phone across the room. Because that was so disgusting. It's so wrong-headed. I don't even want to get into the arguments about how he's misreading the Constitution uh, and, and the re right of religious freedom and how badly that's been taken in our day and age. Just the fact that evil and darkness is being celebrated by our leaders. I mean, if, if we're not in the last days before Jesus returns, I think we're definitely in the last days of this nation. We're following the same path of self-destruction that every other nation, every other empire has followed in human history. We are destroying ourselves by our own stupidity and refusal to stand for right and wrong, for the light in this world. Darkness is called light. Light is cursed and shunned. Evil is called good. Right is called wrong and celebrated. Everywhere we look, we live in a dark world. And the results of the dark world is the devastation that is causing in people's lives. The depression, the sadness, the confusion, the, the hurt that is caused to people, the, the anger, the violence that we see, the constant frustration that people have in this world, all of these things are symptoms of the fact that we are celebrating darkness rather than light. We live in a dark world, a very dark world. But Christ came to be the light. He came to bring us truth. He came to show us right and wrong. He came to fill us with his light, with his presence, to restore that relationship with us and the Father. He came to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we could walk in the light, so that we can walk in harmony with God in this world, living out his will and his desires, and he came to fill us with his light so that we can share that light with other people. Now, some people will still reject it. Some people will curse the light no matter what because it exposes their sins. But some people who are lost need to see the light. They need to be drawn out of the darkness. They need to see the light of Jesus shining through our lives during this Christmas season. All the lights that we put up at Christmas time, it is a reminder to you and to me of our obligation to share the light of Jesus with this world. We receive it. We receive the cleansing, the forgiveness, the grace, the mercy. We're set free from our sin and our guilt and our shame. We're given new life, eternal life of peace and assurance and love and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are meant to shine that out so others can see it and find the same thing in their lives. That's what we're called to do this Christmas season. To be the light of Jesus. Just as he is the light of the world, we are to be the light shining into the lives of other people. You know, every year when we come to the Christmas time, uh, Christmas Eve service especially, we share in the lighting of, of candles. Again, it's the same symbol for us, that as the light is shared with one person and we share it with another, it grows and spreads throughout a church. It's a representation of our mission. We take the light that is shared with us and we share it with other people. Shine it into their lives. That's the, sto that's the, that's the lightning outside, by the way. But, um, but we share the light into, into the lives of other people um, because we want them to know the love and the grace of Jesus. We want them to know the forgiveness and the mercy that we've experienced. So this Christmas season... When you see your tree, remember the life that Jesus offers. When you see the lights on it, remember your obligation to share the love of Jesus. Share his light with this world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the light that you have poured into our lives. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your presence. Fill us with your Holy Spirit 
so that we can walk in harmony with you, so that we can be in the light, so that we can give up the things of this world, the darkness that holds us back, the places where this world has corrupted us and changed our thinking, drawn us away from you. Lord, let us lay those aside, crucify them on the cross so that we can rise to the light of the world, to the new life that you offer us. And Lord, so that we can share that with others. What a privilege we have of being your light in this dark world. Lord, live through our boldness. Use our lives as we seek to walk in harmony with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, as we close our service, let's stand and let's sing together and know